And now I want to officially welcome you to another Age Friendly Live program. Uh, I am your host, Leonid Lenny Orlov. I use he, him, his pronouns. I identify as white. And I am with the Human Services Department. November is National Native American Heritage Month, and we begin our recognition with our guest from Chief Seattle Club. But before meeting Virgil Wade, we'll get a very brief update from our partner, the Seattle Public Library, and learn about COVID-19 and other resources in your community. As I started to talk about, uh, Age Friendly is committed to offering a platform for your civic participation uh, with a connected environment, uh, with accessibility. So today, this month, and every day and every month at Seattle Human Services, we acknowledge that we are on the traditional land of the first people of Seattle, the Duwamish people, past and present. We honor with gratitude the land itself and the Duwamish tribe. We want to invite you to visit duwamishtribe.org to learn more about the Duwamish, people of the inside, people who are still here, and find out how you can get involved. And we thank you very, very much for that. Without further ado, I'd like to uh, welcome Nancy Sloat from the Seattle Public Library. She's the Older Adults Program Manager and our partner in producing these events starting in 2020. Uh, the library has been a valuable partner, both in person and virtually. Uh, and hopefully moving forward, when we move into hybrid space, more in that at the end of the program, we'll, we'll be able to continue collaborating and making these uh, as, as, as good as possible for, for you all. So Nancy, thank you so much for being here. Uh, I'm going to turn the mic over to you. Oh, great. Thank you so much, Lenny. And good morning, everyone. So as the slide says, I'm the older adults program manager for Seattle public library. And I really, uh, create programs and services, um, to, make the library more age-friendly and accessible to everyone. So uh, for those of you who may have been to our programs before, I always have a few minutes now to give a short update on what's happening at the library and um, what's happening with opening our services. And uh, I'll, I'll get to that. And I just want to say again to Lenny and everyone how much I appreciate our partnership with Age Friendly and uh, Seattle Aging and Disability Services and Seattle Human Services. So, so can I have the next slide? So, you last uh, two weeks ago, I said, yes, all of our branches are now open. So I want another round of applause. We're very, very excited. The last branch opened about two weeks ago, the New Holly branch. So we have all 26 neighborhood branches open and the Central Library open. Uh, can I have the next slide? And there are evening hours on um, select at all branches on selected evenings, and we have increased days um, for all of our branches. Many of them are open now seven days a week. Um, for those of you who use the Central Library, it is open on Wednesday evenings, but it's open during the day from Monday through Sunday. Um, if you've been to the Central Library, of course, you know it's a huge, enormous building. And right now we have three of the floors open. Um, we have the 4th Avenue entrance floor open. We have the uh, floor open when you come in on 5th Avenue. We call that the living room. You'll find all the fiction collections there and the DVD collections. And we also have um, our level five, we call that the mixing chamber, which is uh, has 100 computers there and lots of tech help um, up on that floor. So we're definitely planning to open up more floors. Um, you know, uh, floors six through nine of the library have all of our nonfiction collections and the newspapers and the magazines. And uh, we call that the spiral. Uh, because it is a spiral. You walk around it and down through the floors as a spiral. And uh, we're trying to do that as soon as we can. We need to um, have enough staffing to be able to be able to do that. Um, if you haven't been to the Central Library for, 
before. It's a great um, field trip to go explore the building. Um, I know we can't do that now, but when everything opens up a little bit more, there's a self-guided tour. It's great architecture. Um, it's it's a fun building to explore. So could I have the next slide? So because our hours are not quite at pre-pandemic hours, when you go to the li your neighborhood branch, uh, be sure to check on the hours. So you could always call the library. You can check on our website, which is easy, www.spl.org. Um, you can phone our quick information. We have people on the phone lines um, all the times that we're open. Or you could even, if you like, chatting electronically with um, staff, you can do that or you can email. So, you know, many branches are open from 10 to 6 during the day and uh, on their evening hours from 12 to 8. But sometimes the smaller branches have, they have starter lading times. So that's why it's really important to check before you head off to your neighborhood branch. So I also just wanted to give a shout out to our information staff, our reference staff who answer the phones or email or answer in person. They are amazingly, tremendously knowledgeable. And I don't think there's collectively anything that they can't answer. It's really hard to stump them. And we all work collegially on questions if um, it's something that's uh, complicated or we need further information. We answer thousands of questions every month which is, of course, how I started out as a librarian, as a reference librarian, and I still really love it. So could I have the next slide? Right now, the library has a survey that it's asking for community input. We call it the Library Levy Survey. And um, you know, back in 2019, the Seattle voted for a new seven-year levy for the library. So. Um, we uh, uh, are funded um, at, from the general fund of Seattle because we're a department of the city government, but the levy has provided us with um, more funds to use. And one of the things that we promised in the levy was that we would um, increase our hours, uh, open hours for the branches. And obviously with the pandemic, um, we and the COVID shutdown, we had to change those plans. So now that we're um, trying to figure out and we're opening up more and more, we want to get people's input on what are the most important hours to increase. Are they Sunday hours? Um, do people want the buildings uh, open up earlier? Do they want them to stay open till nine o'clock, for example? So we have a 10 minute, uh, takes about 10 minutes to do the survey. And um, I've completed it, and it was really thoughtful survey. It asked me really, you know, what hours I would use the library. I mean, I assumed that I wasn't a staff member and working at the library. And what were the most important services that the library could offer? So the survey is available in seven languages uh, in uh, total, including Spanish and Vietnamese, Chinese, Somali, Amharic, and Tigrinya. And excuse me, it, the the, uh, the survey is open until November eighth, and um, I think we'll put into the chat um, the the actual direct link to the survey. But you can always just go to the library's website at spl.org, and um, you'll see it right on the front page. There, there's a link. So we really encourage everybody to. Um, uh, take the survey so we can get a lot of community feedback. Uh, could I have the next slide? So I'm still tickled that the library now has book lockers. We're piloting it. Um, it's at two branches, the book lockers, um, at the Rainier Beach branch and the High Point branch. And you know, many libraries are beginning to use these lockers, especially during the pandemic, because it gave people access when the buildings were closed to their holds. So lockers are great. Um, it's because there's 24/7 access to them, and um, you know, uh, the library lockers. The picture on the screen. That's not exactly what ours look like. I, they're so new that I still don't have a picture of them. But they'd be similar to something like you see on the slide. And for anybody who's used Amazon lockers, it's the same um, same principle. And 
basically, um, if you want to use one of the lockers, you can choose a book locker location as the, as the place to pick up your holes. Um, it's just like sort of a separate branch. Um, the one thing to remember about them is that normally if you pick up your holes inside the branch, you have seven days to pick them up. But with the lockers, you only have 72 hours. So make sure that you remember. So that's three days. Um, so could I have the next slide? Um, the slide here is of something <coughs> that's called a short story uh, dispenser. And it, I, it's one of the most fun things at the library. And I think it's pretty under the radar. So you can ask the dispenser for a one, three, or five minute short story, and the dispenser just prints one for you, write them in there. I just, I just think, think it's such a cool idea. idea. It, it was, was developed, developed, these dispensers, by a French company, and they were really looking to um, find ways to give everybody what they called unexpected literary moments. So I just think it's a really cool idea. So we have one of the dispensers at the Central Library, and we also have one dispenser in the community at a coffee house on Beacon Hill um, called um, The Station. It's right near the Beacon Hill Library. So if you're at downtown or if you're in the Beacon Hill area, try out this dispenser. It's totally fun and unexpected. Uh, could I have the next slide? So our... Uh, uh, Leap Lab. We actually have a lab down at the Central Library, and I think you've seen some of the pictures, and you're seeing the picture of it here on the slide. And um, the lab isn't quite open yet. We're working on figuring out how to um, situate all the equipment to make sure that we can keep it safe for patrons who are using the lab as well as the staff, but it should open very soon. We do have some of the equipment that um, Cleo in the video referred to. We moved it up um, to another level of the library where all the computers are. And that, for example, includes a refreshable Braille display, which I had never seen before um, until recently, um, where the uh, it's hooked up to a public computer and then it works with a screen raiser to raise braille characters so that um, somebody who's blind or has limited vision can uh, read the screen. Um, and also, I just want to mention that all of our computers in the branches and at the central library have special software on them. We have magnification software and we have what's called JAWS screen reader software which means that um, you'll hear uh, that the, the text on the screen will be read into, we would be wearing earphones. So um, right now you can contact the LEAP staff. Um, they're all working um, to make an appointment um, to get help with library materials or get uh, even community resources. So we're gonna post it in the chat, but you can just email LEAP at spl.org. Um, you can also phone them at 206-615-1380. Uh, uh, and somebody, you will leave a message there and somebody will get back to you. Uh, could I have the next slide? You know, we haven't talked about some of our citizenship uh, classes in a long time. And, but throughout the pandemic, we've been offering three classes. Um, to study for uh, citizenship and the citizen naturalization exam. And we work with partners to um, offer these classes. Uh, of course, they're all virtual now, but uh, we're working now with the Asian Counseling and Referral Service. And um, you can see on the slide, we offer a variety of uh, classes in uh, English and Vietnamese is one class and English and Chinese and English and Spanish. Um, if, um, and then also just straight English. And we have lots of other resources on our website, um, such as materials to study for the naturalization exam, and um, also the questions, the 100 questions um, 
about civics and their answers, and we have those in seven languages. So it's um, uh, definitely contact the library if you're interested in citizenship resources and classes. Uh, could I have the next slide? I always try to talk about some of our author events, and here's an upcoming author event, which um, I just think sounds so interesting. And since I love to cook, um, I'm always looking for ones about cooking and food. So this author event is on November 16th, and it's the author of a new book called Tastemakers, Seven Immigrant Women Who Revolutionized Food in America. Mayuk Sen is the author, and he's a food journalist, um, and he teaches at New York University and has won many awards, including the James Beard Award for Food Writing. And it's basically, the book is a kind of a group biography, and it's weaving the stories of seven <coughs> women who, some of them are known, and some of them are not known, and their experiences, um, uh, he weaves in um, food history, immigration history, gender issues. I think one of the, um, as I looked at the, um, the women that he uh, provides profiles of, I knew Marcella Hazan, who of course is the doyen of um, Italian cooking. So make sure that you register um, through our calendar for the program. And that's at spl.org slash calendar. And then the last program that I want to mention is um, a series of programs that we're offering right now on aging in place. Um, we're looking at different housing options like virtual villages or home sharing, um, which is really intentional roommate matching. And uh, these things can help promote aging in place where you live in your own home or apartment um, or in the community where you're comfortable, um, where you know your neighbors, where there's opportunities for social engagement, where there's um, help possibly with volunteers who can help you with chores or with home repair. And, um, and something like with home sharing, it's another stream of income for you. So the dates uh, of the final two programs in the series are November 9th at 6.30, that's a Tuesday evening, and that's going to be on home sharing. And then the final program is November 16th, also Tuesday evening at 6.30, and that's gonna be on universal design. So how can you make your living space safe? And what kinds of accessibility features uh, do you need now? And what do you think you might need in the future? And is your space where you live going to work for you as you age? And then the uh, final two slides, I just um, encourage you to visit our older adults pages on the library's website. We call our program <laughs> Next Chapter. So the, uh, uh, you can get to that at spl.org slash next chapter. We have our programs listed there. We have book lists. We have curated lists of links to resources. We have blog posts. So um, I invite you to visit there. And then finally, I uh, uh, would love to talk to anybody who wants to talk to me on the final slide, if you can change it. Um, and uh, my email address is nancy.sloat at spl.org. And um, I would very much like to hear from anybody who has ideas for kinds of programs and services that would be uh, helpful at the library. Um, we're constantly evolving the program. So thank you much, everybody. And let me know if there are any questions about the library throughout the rest of the hour. Awesome. Thank you so much, Nancy. So glad you're talking about universal design and other things aging in place. Uh, hopefully you get you get some good turnout uh, at these events. Uh, thank you, Nancy. Uh, thank you for sticking around as well. Uh, so uh, up next, uh, we are right at 11 o'clock and I would like to turn it over to our guest from Chief Seattle Club. Before we do that, just a, a very brief, maybe 90 second update uh, on uh, on COVID nineteen and vaccinations and uh, and you're uh, you probably have heard that uh, 
the vaccine, the Pfizer vaccine is now available for five to 11 year olds. Uh, and that's uh, 180,000 more kids all of a sudden uh, eligible in this area. Uh, and so uh, if you have, uh, or if there's a child in your life uh, that, uh, you know, you're considering vaccination for, uh, you would probably need to get on a wait list at the moment. But as more vaccines are available, you can, um, you know, it can get those more easily. To find it, though, uh, it's recommended to use Vaccine Locator, which is at vaccinelocator.doh.wa.gov. You can find all these links by just going to kingcounty.gov and clicking on the top link for COVID-19, uh, and and there you'll you'll find all this information. Um, however, for 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 people in your life who don't have access to the internet, uh, if you could share the the hotline with them, which is 1-800-525-0127, that's the state's hotline on COVID-19. It can tell you where to get a vaccination and answer any of your questions about COVID, uh, or you can text uh, actually CDC at four three eight. 829. It's a short number. You put in your zip code and they'll respond with what vaccines are available in your area. Uh, so uh, thank you for passing that along. If you have any questions related to aging or disability that aren't answered here today or uh, go uh, outside of what the COVID-19 hotline can answer, there is a network of organizations in your community and it's called Community Living Connections. It's for Seattle and King County, and you can call them at 1-844-348-5464 for resources such as food, meals, rent assistance, and the like. They're also available online if you have access to internet, and that's communitylivingconnections.org. Thank you all so much. I, I, I do wanna move us along here to, to our uh, featured guest, so uh, right now, uh, I'm welcoming to the stage uh, Virgil Wade, and the, uh, the, direct, uh, the deputy director uh, of Chief Seattle Club uh, uh, recently. Uh, and prior joining to joining Chief Seattle Club, uh, Mr. Wade served as general manager for the Snoqualmie Indian Tribe. Uh, Mr. Wade has served over 20 years in various leadership positions, for tribal governments. He previously served on the Casino Arizona Talking Stick Resort Board of Directors, and currently Mr. Wade serves on the Pacific Hospital Preservation and Development Authority Governing Council and the Pawnee Nation Tribal Development Corporation Board of Directors. Mr. Wade, throughout his career, has been a strong advocate for indigenous people's rights. Virgil earned his BA in history from Arizona State University in Tempe, Arizona, and MBA from the University of Arizona in Tucson, Arizona. He enjoys hiking, fishing, snowboarding, and kayaking during his free time. Oh, you're quite an outdoorsman. So uh, Virgil, thank you so much. We really appreciate you being here uh, to help us uh, recognize Native American Heritage Month we uh, can't wait to hear what you have to share with us. Thank you so much for being in this space. The stage is yours. Thank you, Lenny. Um, Noah, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Virgil Wade. As Lenny said, uh, I'm an enrolled member of the Pawnee Nation of Oklahoma. Uh, or, uh, and also I'm a member of the uh, Choctaw uh, tribe on my dad's side. So. Um, when I said Noah the, uh, before, I said good morning. That, that means uh, in our language, in our Pawnee language, that means hello, uh, good to see you type thing. So again, uh, just want to uh, thank uh, Lenny and his staff and, and the rest of HSD for inviting us today, especially during this uh, you know most important month for us as uh, Native people, the Native American Heritage Month, the recognition. So again, uh, just want to. Uh, Thank you again for that. And I'll go ahead and get into the uh, presentation today. I think uh, give you a little bit of uh, background about what we do at Chief Seattle Club. Uh, but before I can do that, I think it's uh, important to share with you uh, a brief presentation slides uh, that will help us go through some of the history. Um, you know, how 500 years of oppression and colonization has led to the unjust homeless rate within the urban native community. Um, so next slide, please. 
So again, uh, some of the things that I hope to uh, cover and, and that we can talk about to, or present to you is the uh, understanding of the history of, of Native people, uh, the trauma of colonization that's still with us today, you know, repairing the mistrust, the importance of de developing culturally specific services for our Native people, and uh, Chief Seattle Club's uh, practices regarding that. Next slide. So uh, again, we're talking about historical uh, trauma. And uh, when we talk about that, uh, there's a quote that uh, we've used uh, in the past uh, that uh, talks about the cumul cumulative emotional and psychological wounding over one's lifetime. Uh, again, uh, from generation to generation, follows the lo loss of lives, land, and vital aspects of culture. Uh, that, that is a quote from uh, Dr. Maria Yellowhorse Braveheart, who is a social, uh, social worker, I think a, a professor and a mental health expert. Next slide. So again, uh, when we talk about uh, historical and intergenerational trauma, you know, on the slide there, we talk about, you know, the things that uh, make that up. That's uh, family violence. Um, it's uh, basically child welfare mental health, substance abuse, gangs, prisons, homeless, homelessness, and health. You know, those are all things that uh, Native people are quite aware of, uh, have lived, uh, you know, from family to family, from tribe to tribe, from nation to nation. So again, we uh, have experienced this throughout uh, our existence uh, and uh, continue to uh, experience it today. So. Along with that, you know, the, the stolen lands, the genocide, the forced removal, oppression, the attack on our culture, and, and the uh, policies, the horrible policies that have uh, been put in place um, that uh, basically have not been kind to uh, natives. Next slide. So when we talk about some of these horrible uh, U.S. policies, again, this is going back uh, through history, and we're talking about um, basically the uh, Indian Removal Act. You know, again, these are all uh, policies that were put into place to basically assimilate uh, Native people into uh, a westernized world. Um, and again, these policies have failed throughout history, uh, have not really ever uh, been uh, in the best interest of Native people. And so, Again, we've, we've faced these uh, time in and time out, uh, as you can tell from the early 1800s. Uh, and to this day, we're still uh, dealing with uh, policies that are not in our favor. But uh, again, we still have strong advocacy uh, people that uh, we have, you know, native lawyers and, and legislative uh, people that uh, act on our behalf, you know, as native nations uh, to continue to advocate for the rights of uh, native people. Um, so you'll just see the list of there. I won't go through all of them, but the, you know, there's different policies there that you can probably look up. And, uh, you know, one of them is the Termination Act. Again, that was to try to terminate, uh, you know, the tribes, uh, again, to uh, force them into assimilation to Western society, to try to get them to, you know, us as Native people to um, live a Westernized uh, life instead of our cultural way of life. So. And then again, you know, the urban Indian relocation programs of the 1950s, that's, uh, you know, was promises that uh, were made uh, if you move to urban areas, uh, you again would be promised jobs and uh, good wages, uh, things that you could, uh, again, assimilate into mainstream society. However, that did not work out. And that's where you see a lot of uh, urban natives that have been uh, from generation to generation that have been left behind have struggled to survive, uh, you know, because they are outside of their cultural setting. And so that, again, is one of the things that we deal with at Chief Seattle Club as far as far as uh, providing services uh, to our ur urban native uh, relatives. Next slide. You know, the only other thing, again, uh, throughout history, there's been atrocity after atrocity. Uh, you know, our, our Native women, uh, again, were uh, faced sterilization. As you can see, uh, between 1970 
to 76, 25% of Native women of childbearing age were unwillingly or unknowingly sterilized. And again, this was tried to minimize our, our Native people uh, to continue to try to keep a, um, a, a cap on it, if you will. Uh, boarding schools, our, our, the children were sent to boarding schools, again, to bring them into mainstream society, to strip them of their culture, their language. And again, this just did nothing but uh, cause uh, atrocity to our Native uh, culture and our people. Next slide. So again, historical trauma and unresolved grief. Uh, Aboriginal people never had enough time between various sequences of new world epidemics, genocide, trauma, and forced assimilation to develop tools for passing through the periodic social and cultural disintegration of their nations. Uh, again, you know, federal laws uh, time in, time again have just prohibited native spirituality. Um, you know, we were forbidden to practice our cultural beliefs and religion. Um, and again, the policies have historically been designed to forcibly assimilate natives into this uh, westernized Euro-American culture. Um, and uh, the, um, in 1871, Congress declared native wards of the government with the goal to civilize. They felt like, you know, uh, native people were uncivilized. And so they were trying to civilize the, the Indian. Um, I think you may, some of you have may have heard the term, you know, kill the Indian, save the man. You know, again, time and time again, uh, tribes have uh, faced this uh, throughout their history. Next slide, please. You know, and again, we just talk about historical trauma there. I think you can go through that. I won't go through all of those. Um, you know, again, it's um, helplessness with a sense of failure and resignation to incapability, contraction with a compression, which can lead to depression, um, you know, exhaustion and collapsing, collapsing of one's stamina, dispiriting the process. You know, those are all things that make up trauma and, and can create uh, trauma. Next slide. You know, this is probably uh, one of one of our uh, real, I guess you'd say, favorite things that we like to uh, talk about is uh, prior to 1492, Native people had a 100% success rate in housing our people. We had thriving housing programs. You know, as we are a communal uh, people. You know, we, we take care of each other. Uh, we have a shared responsibility and shared knowledge. Everyone had a responsibility within tribes, and uh, again, we were organized uh, prior to the uh, Western uh, Westernization that uh, was brought into, um, you know, native life. Uh, you know, again, we had our own way of uh, taking care of ourselves and our families and our communities and our groups, our tribes, our native people. Next slide. So the disparity. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, here in King, uh, King County, in the area here, Native Americans make up 15% 15, 15 of the homeless population, yet we make up just 1% of the general population. You know, that is really concerning to us, really um, just un unheard of. It, it, it shouldn't be that way. And so we're, we're trying to address that again, day in and day out by providing services uh, to our na urban Native uh, relatives. You know, and um, data shows that Native Americans are least likely to utilize support services. And we'll get into, you know, why, um, why that is. Native homelessness numbers continue to rise despite the re recent aggressive approaches to get people housed. And again, there's just um, things that, uh, that uh, stand in the way. Next slide. So again, we talk about how mainstream services leave out the Native community. You know, there's a lack of trust uh, by our native uh, relatives. Uh, we, you know, we've faced so many different failed policies and uh, it's created a lack of trust on our end. Uh, unfamiliar faces, you know, when you introduce a, a person to services and they're not familiar with that, uh, that uh, person, you know, it makes it difficult to, to you know, trust and to, to be able to work. Uh, unsafe space. Um, false assumptions and a lack of cultural understanding. I think that's really important to understand is, you know, the lack of cultural understanding. Uh, we like to think of it as, you know, understanding where we come from and how we, you know, how we uh, used to live, how we are, um, how we practice, 
our religious practices, our cultural practices, those are all very uh, important and sacred to us as Native people. Next slide. So what works in the Native American community? You know, as, as uh, you can see, our Chief Seattle Club's mission, our mission is to provide a sacred space to affirm, nurture, and renew the spirit of Native, uh, urban Native Americans. So again, we try to give them a communal space uh, to come together uh, to uh, be around one another, uh, whether they're from the same tribe, different tribes, it doesn't matter, it's a community. And uh, we strive to provide those, uh, that space that they can come and feel welcomed, feel protected, uh, feel like uh, someone is there for them and for them to just be able to, you know, relax. Next slide. So again, what does work in the Native American community? Again, as we talked about uh, culturally appropriate services, uh, you know, things that are centered around our culture, uh, keeping that uh, at, the, at the forefront of what we do, uh, space of our own, giving us uh, space that, uh, you know, is native space uh, that we can um, provide those services uh, within, uh, shared understanding of experiences, you know, so again, sharing the, the understanding and being willing to, to understand. Um, and then uh, having partners and allies that are willing to ride in the passenger seat. Again, these, uh, it goes back to the policies. Uh, you know, we, we, uh, they were always in the driver's seat and uh, never uh, were in the passenger seat to see how natives lived. You know, we used to farm and we used to do a lot of different things uh, prior to Western uh, colonization. So again, um, those are things that we look for is uh, partners and allies uh, to kind of ride along with us and learn from us uh, as to how we do things and what would make a thriving community. Next slide. So let me get into some of the things that we do and that we're very proud of uh, at Chief Seattle Club. Uh, you know, we talked about the homelessness and uh, providing housing. We have a, uh, a uh, project called Eagle Village. It's a bridge housing project uh, that was developed back in the fall of uh, 2019. And that was uh, created through partnerships with King County and Catholic Community Services. That gave us an opportunity to uh, provide uh, housing uh, shelter uh, type um, rooms for uh, 24 individual rooms. Uh, there can be up to two people in those rooms. Uh, plus, we got an additional five tiny units uh, provided uh, due to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So again, that's uh, allowed us to uh, provide uh, homeless uh, people with um, shelter and, and a roof over their head. Uh, but also it goes further than that. Uh, we provide, uh, it's a secured site so that we provide cultural activities. Uh, you know, we may have bead, uh, beadwork classes. We may have uh, drum making classes. We have uh, mental health class, uh, mental health workshops, uh, counseling. So we, pr we provide a variety of services uh, for our Native uh, relatives in that uh, partic particular site. Next slide. So again, um, We've uh, just started uh, Chief Seattle Club, uh, the current and future housing development. We've got into housing development through partnerships that, uh, like we said, with King County and others that have reached out to us uh, to address uh, housing uh, and homelessness. So again, we've got a uh, project that uh, is getting ready to start right next to our uh, day center uh, down in Pioneer Square. It's called the All All Building. Uh, that's a, a Le Chutzi word for home. And so that's the name of the place is All All. And then we also got another uh, project uh, called Sacred Medicine House that uh, we are working on now. And that, uh, that is due to uh, be open possibly in late uh, 2022 or early 2023. Again, the All All, we're right around the corner to opening that up. We may have that opened up here within the next month. Uh, so we're very excited about those projects again to give uh, people the, um, you know, just give them hope, give them a, a place to, to call home and to give them possibly a new start. Uh, that's just one way that we can help them. But again, as, as we provide this, it goes further than housing. Um, you know, our model that we follow uh, is listening, uh, building uh, 
what what makes sense uh, by listening to our relatives, listening to our members as to what they, you know, their stories, um, you know, as to what happened, uh, how are they feeling, what, what do they need? Uh, instead of uh, building, a, you know, and saying, well, this, you know, this will work for you. We really try to take an active approach. Um, you know, and again, with that, uh, we're exploring other opportunities for future housing opportunities. Uh, we're right now looking at a um, project uh, partnership with North Seattle College uh, and uh, Bellwether Housing, uh, again, to provide uh, affordable housing approximately that that uh, project will be approximately uh, about 200 units in itself uh, these other projects all all that's an 80 unit uh, project uh, and uh, sacred medicine house is about 120 uh, unit uh, project so again we're just trying to provide uh, housing uh, for our relatives and uh, hopefully uh, you know continue to provide them with wraparound services as well uh, when we open these projects Next slide, please. So again, I've, I've gone over this, uh, the, um, the uh, all, all housing project, as you can see on the slide, uh, the, the project itself is the uh, building that is in the middle, uh, right there in the middle. Uh, that is to the right, the, the little two story uh, building, three story building is, is our day center. So we built it right next to it. Um, and again, we're very excited about that project. It's going to have a, uh, a uh, it's going to be staffed 24-7 uh, with case managers. Uh, there's a there's actual clinic uh, on the ground floor with our partnership uh, through uh, Seattle Indian Health Board. And we're also going to implement a workforce development program. Uh, we have a cafe that's uh, going to be in there. And we have a sovereignty farm that we have uh, going right now. Um, that uh, again, we have apprentices that uh, we take out to those different uh, to the sovereignty farm to uh, you know give them uh, some skill sets uh, that uh, maybe help them in the future. Next slide. Um, again, the uh, all, all housing project. You know that uh, what's very important to us. And again, you'll you'll find as you you know talk with natives. Uh, we we. Gave it, you know, kept it a, a native design, the brickwork, uh, the welcoming figure. There's going to be a, a big welcoming figure out in the front, as you can tell there on the model markup. If you look close enough to that tree, that's a welcoming figure there. Um, again, the uh, resident floors are going to be named after different uh, traditional medicine. Um, we've got reflection rooms. We've got a community space for people to gather and, you know, just share uh, stories and ideas and just spend spend time together. So again, we wanted to make make it as welcoming as we could, uh, you know, and make it uh, feel like a true home uh, for them because that is their home. Next slide. The other project that I brought up was the Sacred Medicine House. Uh, again, that's 120 units of permanent supportive housing. Uh, we'll have again staffing uh, of case managers that will be providing uh, case management, uh, wraparound services. We'll have, a, again, a clinical co consultation room for partnering clinicians. Uh, we work with uh, Callitz Mental Health Services right now and Seattle Indian Health Board. So we hope to uh, continue those partnerships uh, with this new project as well. Um, it's a healing model, uh, physical building and, and uh, programming. Again, we all uh, as we build uh, things, we want to make sure that, uh, you know, we're building it appropriately um, and uh, making sure that programming is uh, fitting the needs of our residents and our uh, native relatives. Next slide. So I, I believe that's, uh, again, that's the end of our uh, presentation as far as uh, what we do. Again, at Chief Seattle Club, we're a day center. Uh, we provide uh, services uh, to all uh, native relatives that are uh, that become members of our club. Uh, they're able to come in, and uh, sometimes we have showers. They can take showers. Uh, they can. Uh, we have a day center room. You know, they, uh, a media area, game area, activity room. You know, we just try to provide as many resources as we can 
uh, some people just want to come in and, and you know take a load off and, and maybe they've been out to, on the street all night and so we provide an area for them to just lounge as well um, you know and catch their breath um, we've got a, a dining area where we uh, feed them and, and provide them meals uh, you know breakfast and and uh, lunch but of course we're not able to do that right now because of the pandemic our our day center is closed however we are uh, providing meals uh, at the window. We still are providing meals uh, to all of the community, um, not just our native relatives, but uh, to everyone uh, that is out there that is uh, facing homelessness. Uh, we just felt that that was important uh, to do our part as a community partner. Uh, so we were glad to be able to do that and, and fortunate to be able to as well. Um, we are expanding. You know, we've uh, got a re-entry program now that uh, for people that are coming out of incarceration, uh, we've got, we're starting to develop a, uh, we just got a uh, re-entry house, basically, transitional house uh, for those individuals uh, to get them back up on their feet, to uh, possibly work into a work uh, workforce development program as a part of that. Uh, we've got uh, domestic violence and, and uh, sexual assault counselor uh, that uh, people can meet with, uh, you know, if they're facing those types of trauma. And again, we just uh, try to provide as many services as we can, appropriate services, housing, you know, being a big one. Uh, we have a eviction prevention that we do as well. So we just, uh, again, uh, as Chief Seattle Club, uh, we are trying to address and, and be a, a strong uh, partner uh, to the community by providing these services to our native relatives. So again, I want to thank you uh, for attending today. And uh, again, Lenny uh, and HSD, I want to thank you all for inviting us. I hope that uh, this has been helpful uh, to you as the audience. Uh, and again, just uh, thank you again for recognizing Native, uh, Native American uh, Heritage Month. It's an important month. Uh, we're, you know, I always like to say, you know, we, we have uh, been facing uh, oppression for 500 years, uh, 500 plus years. And we're still here, you know, we're resilient people as natives. And uh, we're also, uh, you know, very uh, people that uh, have a lot of knowledge and, and oral history. So again, yeah, thank you for your time. Uh, I'll turn it back over to you. And Thank you so much, Virgil. Thank you for being here, for inviting us to learn uh, about the history and your culture and what uh, your organization is doing to to imagine world without homelessness that's that's amazing and uh, uh, what I would like to do in the, a little bit of time that we have remaining I do want to introduce my crew that's been working hard in the background here we uh, have Gita Hamam uh, here in the studio you've seen chats uh, with resources from Michael Taylor Judd and then Karen is here Karen Winston uh, all, all three of these folks work in human services and Karen is here actually right here on the stage now uh, for the questions from the audience. So what are folks saying there uh, in the Q&A, Karen? Thank you, Lenny. Uh, we have just a couple of comments, uh, just acknowledging that it was a great presentation and thank you very much, Virgil. Learned quite a bit. Thank you, Karen. Um, I'm wondering uh, if, um, you know, uh, what is, this is, uh, uh, we have a new mayor. So uh, there is uh, hopefully going to be a partnership uh, between the city and your organization. Um, we, uh, there, there's a new homelessness authority that's being created. So. Uh, I guess my, my question uh, is, what is uh, Chief Seattle Club's kind of uh, approach to, to, uh, to collaboration? Has, has there been any talks uh, or anything like that? You know, uh, Lenny, I think, uh, again, great question. You know, we're always looking uh, to, uh, you know, looking ahead, right? We're, we're trying to stay ahead of the curve. And so we are always looking for partnerships, uh, collaboration. You know, we've got a, a great partnership with the, the uh, King County, with the city of Seattle, um, you know, the mayor's office. They've been very supportive of our efforts. And, uh, you know, we've um, just, again, trying to do what we can to address uh, homelessness. 
and uh, be a be a, um, a a strong partner, you know, in, in addressing what we can. Um, but it, you know, it takes a community, right? It takes a community to address this, and especially during this pandemic, you know, it's it, it's hard because people are working virtually. We're having to do a lot of things that uh, are out of the norm, and uh, you know, so we've adapted, right? Uh, you know, and and again, I always like to revert back to you know. We've, uh, as Native people, have uh, have faced a lot of uh, challenges and, and, and things of, uh, throughout history. And so, you know, we adapt pretty well. Um, you know, it's, um, you know, this pandemic, you know, we, we faced smallpox, we've, we faced a lot of different things and we've survived. Uh, so again, it's, it's, uh, and we've been blessed that way, you know, and our, I believe a lot of it's to do with our religion and our culture belief, cultural beliefs. So. Um, but yeah, we, we are always looking for uh, uh, partnerships and uh, have that open lines of communication. Um, you know, we, uh, again, just feel like uh, we are a um, important partner that, uh, you know, that uh, people are starting to um, really want to be a part of, which is great. You know, again, uh, there's, a, there's a lot that can be done with uh, collective um, thoughts and ideas. Yeah, we look forward to, to that collaboration as, you know, the administration uh, changes and the, and the new uh, regional authorities stood up. Um, well, we thank you for, for being here today. Uh, if more questions come in after we go off the air, uh, we'll pass it along to you. Uh, and uh, this presentation will be available for viewing uh, both on Facebook as it was recorded and slightly edited. Uh, on YouTube and then the interaction can happen there as well. I would like to end today actually by inviting you to come back on the 18th of this month to meet our own uh, Rex Brown. He is in human services. He is a new director of a brand new division called Safe and Thriving Communities. And I think uh, perhaps Rex will uh, touch on, on these types of you know partnerships with community agencies and community in general uh, so we uh, really look forward to that join us in the same way you did today you can go to bit.ly forward slash h friendly live uh, or you can join us by phone that information is available at that uh, uh, website there and uh, this is also provided in partnership with the seattle public library so we want to thank them as well uh, last thing a reminder that Community Living Connections is a network of organizations in uh, uh, your community that uh, can offer support with uh, rent assistance, uh, food and meals, and, and you can always call the main number and speak to an advocate. The number is 844-348-5464. Uh, or uh, you can visit them on the web at communitylivingconnections.org. We're, uh, we're over time, so I want to let you all go. Uh, do have a bit of breaking news, though. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we'll be meeting Rex Brown next time, and, and this is the sister program currently of Close to Home called the Civic Coffee Hour. Well, over uh, in the future, in 2022, we're planning to merge the two programs under the same name, civic coffee uh, to take place just once a month on a third Thursday like the coffee hour used to uh, and these will now be a full 90 minutes uh, and feature both government and community leaders and be in a panel format which we found was the the most well received throughout this year when we did that for example during pride month uh, another exciting difference is that these will no longer be virtual nor will they be in person they will actually be fully hybrid events once we get that going so that way you could still attend you know at the central library like you did in early 20 uh, 2020 you can attend at your local community or senior center or cultural center or anywhere else that you consider close to home uh, in your home or at a friend's house so look for uh, more information on that uh, in 2022 uh, as always, thank you for being an age-friendly champion. We welcome you to subscribe to our YouTube channel. It's called Aging King County on YouTube. And uh, we appreciate you all very much. We hope you enjoyed the rest of your week and weekend. Uh, and the Svidania. I will see you next time.